There's a passage in the canon. A group of monks are going off to a foreign land. They go to say goodbye to the Buddha, pay their respects, and he asks them, have you gone to see Sarabhuta? They said no, they hadn't. So he recommends that they do. And so when they come and pay their respects to Sarabhuta, he asks them, suppose you meet someone who's intelligent in a foreign land. What do you, if they ask you, what does your teacher teach, what are you going to tell them? So they ask him what he would recommend that they tell him. The first thing he starts out with is, our teacher teaches the subduing of passion and delight. Now, most of us, if we heard that as the first thing that the Buddha taught, would probably run away. We like our passion, we like our delight. But the important thing is that Sariputta starts off with an action. The Buddha teaches you something to do. And as he explains it, if the person asks passion and delight for what, you say for the five aggregates. What's the advantage of doing away with that passion and delight? Well, first, what's the danger of having that passion and delight? It's that you suffer. As those things change. And the advantage of abandoning that passion, passion and delight is you put an end to suffering. So it's all about doing. You look at it from another point of view. The Buddha's first teaching, the Eightfold Path, was a recommendation of what to do. So the teaching starts out with action as its basic principle, that your actions do have consequences, they are important, and there are shoulds and should nots. Now the Buddha's shoulds are conditional in the sense that if you want to put it into suffering, this is what you have to do. He's not forcing anything on you. But he is giving you guidance, because as he said someplace else, our normal reaction to suffering is bewilderment and a search. The bewilderment is we don't know what to do. Why is this happening? What can we do? And if you don't believe in the principle of human action, you stay bewildered. There are people who used to go and see. It's interesting that the Buddha rarely went out of his way to find other people and argue with them, but those who taught doctrines that basically left you without any hope for making a difference in the present moment, in other words, teaching that everything is a result of past action or everything is a result of the will of a creator, or that everything is totally without cause, those kinds of teaching, he said, leave you bewildered, because there really is no should or should not. If everything is determined, there's nothing you can do. If there's no connection of cause and effect, then no matter what you do, you can't have an impact on anything. You're lost. You have no recourse when suffering comes up. So it's teaching you what to do when you suffer, so you don't have to suffer. And that way his teaching is a gift. And as with any gift, when you receive it, you want to make good use of it. You don't want to just throw it away. You learn to appreciate the generosity of the person who gave it, and try to put it to the best use possible. So what is the best use possible? Well, you look at your own actions, because that's where the teaching is aimed. And you look at the results of the actions that you're doing right now to see if there's any connection between what you're doing and the fact that there's suffering in the mind. This is why the Buddha says that uncertainty is overcome by looking at skillful and unskillful qualities in the mind. One, you're focusing your attention on the most important issue in life is what sort of impact are your actions having, and particularly what kind of impact are your mind states having, because it points to the source of action, which is in the mind. 
And if you're uncertain about different mental qualities, well, watch. Try developing goodwill. Try being generous. Try observing the precepts. See what kind of impact this has on your life. At the same time, try to develop the qualities that allow you to judge these things in fairness and with accuracy. Try to be mindful. Try to be alert. Mindfulness is what connects cause and effect. If you don't have any mindfulness, i.e., if you can't remember what you did, you're not going to be able to figure out, well, how is this feeling of pain or this feeling of pleasure related to my actions, if my actions were things that I did a while back and I've forgotten about them. So you have to try to keep in mind what you've been doing. And if you see any suffering coming up, try to trace it back. What is this related to? What kind of attitude is this related to? And the fact that there's pain in the body, that's a normal part of life. But the fact that there's a pain in the mind, that doesn't have to be there. And so what's causing the pain in the mind? You can trace it back to some action. Then you've got a handle on things. You can end your uncertainty. You can end your bewilderment. Of course, this requires alertness as well. So you really are paying attention to what you're doing. So many of us don't. We go through life going through the motions. without looking carefully at our intentions. And often if you ask somebody, well, why did you do that? They have to cast back and they can't think of why, so they come up with a why. But if your mindfulness is shaky to begin with, that, that's really unreliable. You really want to be alert to what you're doing, i.e., what you're intending right now. And the more alert you are, then the more you'll be able to remember it. This is why mindfulness and alertness go together. So you combine these two qualities with the, the Buddha's shoulds and should nots. That's what ardency is all about. When the Buddha gave a categorical teaching about skillful and unskillful actions, he didn't just say it's the distinction between the two that's a categorical truth. He says it's unskillful things should be abandoned, skillful things should be developed. Again, there's a should there and there's a recommended course of action. And so as you actually pursue that, that's what ardency is about. And you bring all these things together, mindfulness, alertness, ardency. In the beginning you develop them as you follow the precepts. This is one of the reasons why the precepts come so early in so many of the Buddha's teachings. In the Eightfold Path, before he talks about meditation, there's right speech, right action, right livelihood. In his graduated discourse, virtue follows right after generosity. You look at the things you're doing in your day-to-day -day life. This is how you develop your mindfulness and alertness. And if you see that you're causing any harm, you try to drop that harm. Fortunately, the Buddha doesn't force you to reinvent the Dharma wheel every time you practice. He gives you guidance. He says, across the board, you don't want to kill, you don't want to steal, you don't want to have illicit sex, you don't want to lie, you don't want to take intoxicants. That last one is important, because as he said, we're already intoxicated with youth, we're intoxicated with health, we're intoxicated with beauty, we're intoxicated with life. The mind is drunk already. And you don't want to add any more intoxication on top of that. It's 
because you won't be able to develop the mindfulness and alertness you need in order to see things. So you try to hold to these precepts and see what impact they have on your life. That's the only way you're going to come to any kind of certainty. And it's the only way you're going to have a life that really is a good container for the practice. You see this so many times on retreats when people just come in off the street and they have to spend a whole week just being with their breath. If there's any unskillful behavior in their past, it's going to come up at some point or another in the retreat. I myself have never been to many meditation retreats, but I do remember one in particular where halfway through the retreat this one guy just broke down and started sobbing in the middle of the afternoon and it went on for about 10-15 minutes. I found it very disturbing. Everybody else in the room was sitting there as if nothing were happening. I found out later this is a normal thing on retreats. turned out this particular person had been a cocaine dealer. And some of the stuff he'd been engaged in was coming up. And so if you have big wounds in your life like that, it's very difficult for the mind to settle down and really be mindful and alert with enough stability to see things as they're actually happening and to direct your attention in a wise direction. This principle of virtue is very important as a container for the practice and as basic training in mindfulness and alertness and the quality of ardency which eventually you're going to bring to the body in and of itself, or feelings, or mind states, or mental qualities. But for it to come to those frames of reference with a lot of solidity, you've got to have practice in your daily life. So you remember to stick by the precepts, and you watch over your behavior. You're alert to see when you might be breaking your precept. And if you feel any temptation to break it, that's when you develop the quality of ardency, trying to figure out how not to. Most often the problem is that a good half of the mind wants to break the precept. And so even though there are lots of skills that the Buddha recommends for holding the precepts, learning how to say no to your greed, no to your anger, no to your delusion. We apply those teachings in only half-hearted way. And then we say, well, they're not working, and so then you go and give in to the temptation. You haven't given the teachings a fair trial, a fair chance. And the result of this half-heartedness is we stay bewildered. Wonder, is the Buddha really right about skillful behavior? Try to behave skillfully, and all you do is find yourself getting really tense about it. Is it all that skillful? Well, the question is, why are you getting tense? This is the mind's way of looking for an excuse not to stick with skillful behavior. There are ways of sticking with the precepts and staying perfectly relaxed around it, because after all, the mind is at a state of normalcy when it's not killing, not stealing, not engaging all these other unskillful forms of behavior. It's only when you're really true with yourself that you're going to see the truth. This is what it comes down to. And John Lee makes this point many, many times, as did John Fuang. The reason we are uns we're uncertain is because we're not looking truly at what we're doing. There are things we hide from ourselves. Things we don't want to admit to ourselves that we did, or the intentions that we acted on.
that we don't like to admit to ourselves. And this is what keeps us bewildered. And the only way out of this is to finally to admit to ourselves that, yeah, we are causing suffering. This is what we keep running up against. There's suffering going on. And you want to learn how to get past all the mental subterfuges and elaborate excuses we can give to keep on doing the behavior that part of us likes but also knows is not really skillful. And when we've decided we've had enough, okay, that's when we're really ready for the practice. So suffering is what causes us to be bewildered, but it's also what reminds us that we want to stop being bewildered. Because otherwise we're just going to keep banging our heads against that suffering. So that's where the other reaction comes in, the search. Maybe there's a way out. Maybe there's somebody who knows something about how to put it into suffering. And the Buddha stands ready to give you his advice. So it's up to you as to when you're going to be ready to take it. <laughs>